congregated here in the virtual space, then we will launch into our discussion. Thanks so much for being here with us. Thank you. All right, so we'll go ahead and jump in as folks are still joining us. Hi, everyone. I'm Julia, a bookseller with Politics and Prose. We are live with Tom Vanderbilt and Virginia Hefferman discussing Beginners, the Joy and Transformative Power of Lifelong Learning. You can follow the link in the chat to purchase the book directly from us at Politics and Prose. If you have a question for Tom or Virginia, please use the Q&A feature found at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to answer those questions during the latter portion of the discussion, though apologies in advance if we simply run out of time. Before we begin, we really want to thank all of you tuning in for joining us. We're so thankful to our family of loyal customers who keep our business and our spirits afloat. It's my absolute pleasure to introduce our speakers. Based out of Brooklyn, Tom Vanderbilt has written for numerous publications and is a contributing editor for Wired UK, Outside and Art Forum. He has previously authored You May Also Like, Taste in an Age of Endless Choice, Traffic, Why We Drive the Way We Do and What It Says About Us, and Survival City, Adventures Among the Ruins of Atomic America. Tom has also appeared on a wide range of television and radio programs, including the Today Show, the BBC's World Service, and NPR's Fresh Air. He has been a visiting scholar at NYU's Rudin Center for Transportation Policy and Management, a research fellow at the Canadian Center for Architecture, a fellow at the Design Trust for Public Space, and is a winner of the Warhol Foundation Arts Writers Grant, among other honors. Virginia Hefferman is a journalist, critic, and author, most recently of Magic and Loss, The Internet is Art. She is a contributing editor at Wired, a co-host of Slate's Trumpcast podcast, and a columnist at the Los Angeles Times. In Beginners, Vanderbilt tackles one of life's biggest questions. Why do so many of us stop learning new skills as adults? Are we afraid to fail? Have we forgotten the sheer pleasure of being a beginner? Or is it simply a fact that you can't teach an old dog new tricks? Inspired by his young daughter's insatiable need to know how to do almost everything and stymied by his own rut of mid-career competence, Tom Vanderbilt begins a year of learning purely for the sake of learning. He tackles five main skills and picks up a few more along the way, choosing them for their difficulty to master and their distinct lack of career marketability. That is chess, singing, surfing, drawing, and juggling. On behalf of Politics and Prose, please join me in welcoming Tom Vanderbilt and Virginia Hefferman. Thank you. Thank you, great to be here. Uh, yes, it is. Hi, it's so, <laughs> hi. Um, just for for um, for the audience, it is just it, it, Tom and I have, have been friends for a long time, but I haven't seen you um, for a, a very long time, and it was wonderful to hear all your accolades. It's like the only way that I have of really keeping up with you, um, aside from beginners, which I just got through. I just got through loved, and um, and it gave me a real sense of sort of where you where you've been for the last uh, several years. Um, and so that was exciting. Yes, and, th and thank you so much. It's lovely to see you. And thank you so much for giving up your Friday night to be here and for, for rescheduling uh, after what was uh, a pretty you know, interesting time in the nation's capital. I was, I was thinking if, if things kept along as they were going, we might be doing this reading at, you know, I was thinking it should be rebranded as political despair and prose books. But, oh, uh, or yes. Some, yeah, you know, the politics part was really weighing heavily on, on, on this. But anyway, we're, we're, we're through the... I, we're thought through the <laughs> I thought if it was Fort Sumter, we might have be doing this under the QAnon flag. Um, <laughs> that, you know, that politics and prose would be, in, would be, uh, be uh, occupied also. Um, but fortunately not, we survived. I'm glad it got canceled because I have so many proud boys that are, that, are, that are my core readership that, you know, it would just have been a disaster. So anyway, let, let's move on. I'm sorry. Let's, let's, All um, right. Um, so, um, so the thing that comes to mind when I think about um, kind of revving up my old engine to try to um, learn something new is how vulnerable I feel. And sometimes I even feel vulnerable, like um, a, a, a financial person just explained to me why I shouldn't have a quote margin account at 
Robin Hood. And I know kind of what a margin call is, but I didn't know what a margin account was. And I almost let it go just because I didn't want to say, what's a margin account? You know, I just didn't want to be in the one down position of having something explained to me. So tell me about the vulnerability and how, like whether that was something to get over when you embarked on the journey to, to study these five subjects. Absolutely. And, and, and like you, just, just the everyday business of living already presents enough challenges for me. I mean, my, my annual trip to my accountant, he's asking me these questions and I'm, I'm sort of like, you know, is there, an, is there an, a reasonable, uh, uh, excuse me, responsible adult in the room? Because I really don't know what you're talking about. Um, so yeah, that, that's challenge number one, just living. Uh, but yeah, these were, uh, you know, uh, it, the question is, why would you want when you're sort of like, you've worked all your life to get to a certain level of, of this mid-career competence, as it was described, and, and you're sort of feeling pretty good about yourself, your work. I mean, not that not that even that isn't prone to vulnerability. I mean, writers among, yeah. you know, particularly face a lot of rejection on, on a weekly basis. So, you know, but we're, we're, we, we develop that thick skin, but I did not have that thick skin in, in other ways. And there were things I sort of, you know, had always wanted to take a stab at. And saw other people taking a stab at and tried to put myself in their place and imagine that. But yeah, just that sense of, you know, why would I want to look bad in front of people? Uh, there, there's an, yeah. I guess it's an ego, ego protection thing going on there, a, a sense of almost guilt that it, if it's not really going to help my career or be that immediately useful in my life, like yeah. juggling, you know, why should, why should I be wasting time on these things? So, I mean, there were a number of, of hurdles and, and then, and then sheer time, you know, that feeling of, yeah. This is way too indulgent to uh, be, be taking on all these things, even though I was, you know, in theory, working on this stuff. But um, yeah, yeah. So, and and it's not that I still don't fear uh, feel this immense, you know, vulnerability. I was just uh, introduced to some people who are surfers, and they were because I was looking for some new surf buddies, as it were, and they said, "Oh yeah, we're going out on Saturday," but I, I didn't know them, so I didn't really know how good they were. So I was I was a little yeah. hesitant, and I didn't want to just come out outright and ask, "Are, are you guys good?" Because if yeah. not, I, I don't want to, if, if you are, I don't want to really be with you, but anyway, yeah. so I, I, I'm, I'm trying to manage that, that fear. Yeah. Well, the, um, yeah, the, the, and even getting in the position of learning these things, you have to sort of gauge how good you might be at it. I know my son has just picked up chess. Everyone plays on chess.com now. And like that you need for tennis, chess, some other things, you need some metric to tell who you're playing with. And also some way to say like, I'm not good. I'm not gonna give you a run for your money, right? So yeah. like, <laughs> right? Um, but so we, let's, let's go in order of each thing you tried to learn and how okay. that vulnerability manifested itself because it's very different to feel that you're, you're st a beginning at chess than beginning at surfing, God forbid, which has a whole level of other vulnerabilities. And, um, and did you have any natural competence that you knew about in any of them going forward. So let's let's walk through each one. Um, we, let's um, go in the order of the book. Okay. So chess would lead us off, and yeah, I mean, yeah. It, right away you bring up the idea of natural competence, which is a very interesting yeah. question, which we could probably spend the whole hour talking about. But you know, I, I, it's a it's a it's a question whether you know to what extent there are natural competencies and how much mm -hmm. they they influence what's going on and how much you can overcome your natural incompetence. But um, so uh, competence towards chess, not really. I, you know, I've been playing games my whole life. That's sort of the only sort of meta cognition going on there that I had. I knew about games. I sort of knew how to play games, but not that I was that good at them. I mean, for example, I'm, I'm terrible at poker. And you'll yeah. find that in the world of especially professional chess, there's a lot of crossover because sometimes they play poker because they can actually make more money that way. So I was, yeah. terrible, at, <laughs> I was terrible at poker. So that didn't bode well for the, the chess. And the, the great thing about chess is that well, number one, it's, it's brutally honest. You have this rating system you're given starting, yeah. you know, at, at 400 or whatever. And you know exactly where you're situated. You know, Magnus Carlsen, the world's champion is up here at 2,800 or whatever. And you're down here, but, but luckily, you know, you're, you're usually paired against people at that rating. So mm -hmm. you, you're sort of allowed to dip your toe in the water there and you're not immediately thrown into a, a pool of grandmasters. Um, but what sometimes happened though, is you'd go to a tournament and there would be some kid there who had been playing online a bunch of times or for years or something. And he would come into the tournament ranked like 400 and he would in reality be like a 1600 and you would just get blown away by this person. So, so, you know, anyway, so ch chess definitely has a way of, of humbling you and there's, there's nowhere to hide. You can't blame luck. I mean, poker, you can claim a, uh, blame a bad hand. 
there are no yeah. bad hands in chess. So um, yeah. the other thing going on with chess is that I had my daughter participating at the same time, often in some of the same tournaments. So I kind of had this <laughs> both um, feeling immense sense of, of pride, but also, you know, a bit of competitive edge and when wondering, you know, could I beat her? But then of course we were paired against each other and then that just threw out everything. And, and she beat me anyway, and I, I didn't really allow her to win, but she beat me. So um, I'm, I'm a middling chess player. And I, in the book, I talk about mediocrity, the Latin for mediocre being halfway to the top. And I, I oh. feel like, yes, yeah, so I feel like, you know, just, it's a word that we, has a pejorative sense, right? Mediocrity, mm -hmm. mediocre. But I, I feel if, if I've, if I can get halfway to the top, that's this big chunk of progress that from yeah. where I started. So there, there are many people I beat along the way to get there. So I'm not, you know, I'm not claiming any great chess panache. So it's just, you know, an, an enjoyable pastime that uh, has a great, you know, culture and history. And then something like the Queen's Gambit comes along. Mm. And it, for, one, for once, I actually feel on top of some cultural phenomenon because I know exactly that's... what's going on. So oh anyway. uh, yeah. Um, and right, Gary Kasparov uh, supposedly, um, you know, probably choreographed the games for that. So it's yeah. um, it's actually, you know, like it, the problem with me in television is I watch Homeland and then think I know everything <laughs> about national intelligence. And then someone tells me that it's, you know, all hooey. So I was given, I was confident um, and I could even drag my son into watching it, knowing that the games were the real thing. Um, so yeah, ch chess people yeah. like to complain about how often boards are shown in movies like James Bond movies and the villain will be like playing chess, but the pieces are in a completely illogical or, or even, you know, illegal, <laughs> illegal position. So don't, don't get chess people started on that, but. Oh, not ch a movie, chess and movies. Um, did you, so, you know, you mentioned mediocre, but the other word might be amateur and, um, but amateur implies love. And I, I think I bought the argument of the book Flow, which I understand may have been canceled now, but like, let's just, you know, when it first dawned on us that to do something well, you have to first like it, you know? And then that moves in tandem with your competence. And if you like something, you do it all the time and then you get good at it. And then that feeds your liking and you're in this constant flow state. But it, with some of these, you had to like gear up to kind of like it, you know? It wasn't like, I've always loved, you know, I think uh, Maria Konnikova who wrote about poker always felt drawn to the game. And, you know, you hadn't always felt drawn to these activities. Exactly, and that's why really I didn't choose one activity to try to, not even necessarily to master, but to just focus on, because I, I was worried at the back of my mind, what if I don't like this thing? What if I, what if I set out to do this great thing? And it turns out after two weeks, I, I'm bored. This is why I couldn't uh, become a grad student because I, I, my attention span is just short. So I had to become a journalist because I can only you know, have a week's worth of attention. But yeah. I know you're right. You know, it's you f the, the, be the better you feel as you're doing something that that comes with its own pleasure. But, you know, even in the, even in the rocky beginnings, there was just, I don't even know if pleasure is the word, just this, this persona of excitement going on as, you know, going yeah. into a, going into this drawing seminar. I, I couldn't remember the last time I had been in sort of a classroom seminar setting and there were, you know, 12 other people and it felt like the first day of school and I, we we're all sort of checking each other out and, you know, who's, who's the teacher and, um, you know, where do we sit? And just, it just, I brought all my, my sharpened pencils and my school supplies and it, uh, it just felt, you know, very sort of energizing and, uh, yeah. and, you know, we were all asked day one to hour one to draw this self portrait, which was talk, talk about, you know, being thrown into the it's fire. Yeah. And I produced, you know, what might charitably be de described as, you know, something my daughter at the time four could have done. Um, and, you know, as did most other people though. So we were all, you know, a, a tide of a rising tide of mediocrity lifts all boats here. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, so there, there, the ple pleasure might be a, a different thing, but there's, you know, as you get into it a little bit more and discover what you like about the things, um, it, it, cause there are, you know, that that's an element too. Um, well, let's, then let's go to ch stay with chess for a sec. So what did you like about chess? What kept you playing? I mean, let's pretend the book doesn't exist. Like <laughs> why even, you know, you could have fudged it and said, oh yeah, I really, I gave chess a shot, but you must have found some way to keep, to keep dragging yourself to, to tournaments and keep trying to study the game. Yeah. And I, I guess the, the, 
emphasis is on the first part of what you just said, because I am a classic, you know, playing too much, not studying enough sort of player. So this, I wow. love, I love the dopamine hit of playing, you know, a five minute blitz game online the same way I like playing uh, video games, you know, to this day, I, I and, and a lot of people have experienced this on all sorts of online games or any yep. other sort of game. But, um, and the thing about chess though, is that, you know, that's not really the way to really get better at the end of the day. You can, you can you know, reach a certain level of improvement, but it, it does require a great amount of study. And mm -hmm. I was talking recently to someone who told me they knew a, a, a person with a PhD who was also a grandmaster in chess. And for them, the PhD was the easier thing by far to acquire. Oh. I mean, we're, we're talking, you know, thousands of hours of study. The, the, the yeah. chess literature is immense. It's hard to read chess books. They come with this algebraic notation. It hurts my head. I, I have that stuff. I have to force myself a little bit to do. And that's where a coach kind of came in handy because someone telling you what to do, not leaving yeah. to, to your own devices, which in my case was my phone where I would play blitz chess. <laughs> Got it. Right. And blitz chess for, for listeners is, um, you know, some kind of, some people call it buzzer chess, speed chess. Um, you know, you get it done quickly and it's not tournament. It's not the, the chess that makes a grandmaster, but it can no, be. Although they, they, but they do like to, I mean, Magnus Carlsen loves to play blitz and they all, and which is, oh, a, which is a funny thing. Cause you get to the idea of if you're a professional at something, you know, ha, has the fun gone out of it to some extent yeah. after all that practice, but someone like Magnus, you know, he doesn't have to be doing these blitz tournaments on, on YouTube or Twitch on the weekends, but, but there he is just, just mixing it up. And uh, so, you know, I, I, it's an interesting thing that, just, uh, you know, doesn't really apply to my life. I'm, I'm just, you know, I find it fun, but I have very low stakes in, in the game. I, yeah. I don't have my career riding on this or anything, but. Uh, all right. Well, I want, I want with chess for you to go a tiny bit deeper, which is to say that chess is just, so often represented in the culture as a proxy for intelligence writ large, right? Some of yeah. these things aren't like some people can draw, some people can't, some people can think, some people can't, but you know, you lead with this guy is a grandmaster or a master at chess. So, you know, I, I think you probably saw the first ever uh, Muslim um, head coach in the NFL. He just signed Robert Sala is also a chess, they call him a chess expert. Um, and, um, and he, so he has some very good ranking and he's, you know, a legitimate chess player, but that's another way of marking that he has this extraordinary intelligence, not just a hobby. D did you have to face as I do playing chess, like certain fundamental kind of parts of the infrastructure of your intelligence, you know, and, and how was that humbling? Yeah. And, and there were, there were, there are there are days to this, to this moment where I feel like I don't have a strategic bone in my body that, I, you know, I play these very tactical games, but that a lot of, you know, and the, yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure my, my study of chess has been all that uh, efficient, let's say, but um, I, I'm trying, I'm trying, I lost my train of thought. Your original, what was your original question? About oh, yeah. So, so, you know, it seems like you might've found out that you're, you know, there's those schools, oh, yeah. like a romantic player, an aggressive dynamic player, like Kasparov, yeah. or a, or a, or a, like you say, a very tactical player. Um, and, yeah. and that might've given you some sense. Cause when I've been playing chess a long time, I start seeing everything in terms of chess, you know, like even how words connect or whatever. And so you really like get down there in the weeds of your neurology, your interaction with the world. And what did you learn about yourself in that? Yeah. But I mean, you know, chess is you, you get out of it what you put into it. You have to do the work. You have to put in the study. If I put in more study, I would inevitably have a higher rating. I mean, yeah. yes, yes. If, if me and you each put in 5,000 hours of chess study, one of us might come out better and then then you start to think yeah. about well maybe 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 your brain is a little bit better situated for that or, or there could be you know cultural reasons I mean uh, as I talk in the book my daughter faces this thing going on in the world of chess to this day that female players are, are perceived to be not as good as male players and the, that's sort of, there's sort of a statistical uh, truth to that but there's some things possibly going on behind that truth which is that Number one, that there's the stereotype that exists, and if you if you listen to psychologists who talk about stereotype threat, a woman going into a chess tournament has this idea hanging in her head that she's not as good as the males. I mean, they've mm. done study they've done studies, and girls who have the same rating as boys underperform when playing against those boys. 
you know, and that, that's it. That's in li- that's in live tournaments. I'd be I'd be curious to see what might have happened, you know, with a shift to online where you might not be aware of the gender of who you're playing. So, um, that, um, yeah, that's the the stereotype problem is very interesting, and I I bet it comes along other lines too. I mean, even as we've adjusted to the idea that the brain grows and that you can teach an old dog new tricks, or at least an old human has plasticity and has um, capacity to grow. We also have carry around certain um, stereotypes, or sorry, certain ideas of our limitations that are like, I'm a humanities person. I could never do science. And like, it's so hard in me to think that way. Um, Or like you just said, money. Money just, you know, as just a matter of course, I'll never really understand accounting. Or, uh, or, you know, and maybe because I'm a woman or maybe because I'm, you know, whatever you attach it to, um, it could just be like, that's for other people, you know? And, um, and you know, like, yes, like uh, so many grandmasters um, are Russian. So few of them are um, American and it could just be chess. That game is just not for a person like me. And how much of that did you face? And let's move on to the next field. If you faced some idea of like Tom Vanderbilt, just like I can think of myself at four and 14 and 24, I'm just not a person who can draw, you know? Um, what's yeah, the next I, one? And we'll, we'll try it there. You know the order better than I do. I mean, it's interesting though, cause you know, I, there, there were things when, when we talk about what I chose to do for this book, there were things I could have chosen that I've really never gotten very good at in my life that I would like to get better at something, anything in the field of math. I was a terrible math student, but I wanted, as I wanted this book, number one, to be fun and enjoyable to research and then to write. And because it wasn't necessarily about, about proving something to myself that I could overcome this, this innumeracy that I suffer from. uh, I, I, I purposely didn't include, you know, that algebra calculus seminar at MIT, which probably would have been, would have destroyed me, but um, so so yeah. So I I, I opted for the uh, you know the sort of easy college curriculum here, the sort of <laughs> that, that, that the athletes take. But um, okay, so next next would, though would be um, singing, as I recall. Yeah. Uh, yes. Super interesting. Um, yeah, that's you, I, another one. I just have, like always been told I can't sing, um, and I probably would be very scared to choose that. Now, did you feel like you had an aptitude or an attraction to singing before you jumped in? An attraction, but not an aptitude. I mean, I mean, no okay. one had no one had ever uh, pointed out an aptitude, and there was one frightful, you know, sort of pre-internet, thankfully, karaoke outing that you know people would talk about it. You know, so we, I think we've all been there. And I mean, but it's a thing I, I think I like to ask people. I mean, can you remember the last time that you sang somewhere in, in public I, with? People? I mean, <laughs> right. I mean, sometimes terrifying. You know, sometimes you're especially with kids, you're forced to sing the horrible song, Happy Birthday, that you write about. Um, it, it, you know, that's just like a trial. And if Happy Birthday is the only song you sing in public and you kind of make this point, then nobody's good at Happy Birthday. And it's just yeah. a defeating, the song that defeats the spirit. Um, talk about yeah, Happy that. Birthday <laughs> and also the learning to sing. Yeah, Happy Birthday and the National Anthem, the, these songs that we sing, and, and we, we sing very infrequently too. And, you know, like maybe, you know, I don't know, 12 times a year or something depends who you are, but it's like, yeah. not only are we not that good at them, we're not, we're not practicing them very often. So that was, uh, right. you know, the, yeah, there's this whole, you know, sort of sad thing that goes on in, in, in life really, which is that, you know, children are, are born, you know, with this, this incredible musical nature. And as parents, we sort of pick, pick up on that and respond to that. And it sort of briefly liberates our own singing, uh, you know, sort of oppressed. Oh dormant, yeah. Dormant singing, um, desire that I think we all have. And this, this is what happened to me, you know, and it, it would just be me and my daughter though in her room. And she didn't really, she's too young to give me any feedback. She's just smiling. She, you know, <laughs> she doesn't care if I yeah. hit the note or not. So, but it's incredibly, incredibly vulnerable, obviously emotional. And there's some really interesting studies about how, how the, the sort of the, the throat, the uh, kind of the vocal apparatus is just loaded with, with nerve endings and it's sort of tied into mm. the vagus nerve, which gets linked to depression and all sorts of emotions. So that it's just a very sort of poignant, you know, potent uh, apparatus there that, you know, it's no wonder that we then feel a little bit, you know, uh, hesitant to open that up in front of other people. It's, it's just so much different than speaking, even though it's just sort of a, an extension of speaking in a way. Um, there's just, you know, 
Sorry. It was yeah. interesting because because I've been doing podcasting now for a while, and um, you know, when you and I were sort of beginning journalists, um, and people, you know, you kind of go to readings or talks or or see panel discussions. There was a particular affect of the '90s that was quite monotone, and it was sort of how I thought you were supposed to talk in public, and when and and on the podcast. And when my producer told me, you know, that I it had to be much bigger, you know, and they always tell you this on TV too, just like you know, more emotion. And and yeah. I've completely changed the way I talk, but it was such a stretch because uh, that lyricality seemed um, silly or something. You know? Yeah, I feel like it you're yeah, like like, <laughs> like the '90s, like like Whit Stillman movies or something, like the way oh, they, yeah. you know, they were all, you know. Uh, but but yeah, no, it's something that I even doing the audio version of this book, I was you know really encouraged by the engineer to. I mean, actually, this time I wasn't. I've done it before, where I in, in previous years where I, I did have that incredibly monotone thing going on. But then after after being led through the ringer of this book and talking to all these vocal coaches who who told me I had this horrible monotone voice and, and who knows you know maybe I do right now I can't hear myself that well but it's yeah, <laughs> yeah um but these it, the voice is a funny thing it's it's something you've carried around for you know in my case 50 some years and never really no one likes the sound of their own voice number one but yeah. it's not something you really get feedback on and you the brain can't even really hear what sound you're actually making so you have this sort of hazy sense of and just there's a lot of habit there I mean think of how many I forget the number of, uh, there's a statistic about the number of words we utter every day. So it's, it's the ultimate practiced activity that we don't think about. Mm. So when someone comes That's, along and tells you, hey, you know, you're kind of speaking, the way you're speaking might, you know, sort of damage your voice or, um, <laughs> and this person, did, told, well, this person had told me this because I constantly was getting hoarse and, and I, I, you know, and still do. But so, yeah, there's things going on there that could be improved. It's, it's a motor skill like, like any other. Um, so tell me about um, if chess could lead to sort of insecurity broadly about intelligence. I feel like the voice lessons might, as you say, tap into, you know, what's my um, mood profile, right? So like, oh, I must be an anxious person who carries stress in my throat. You know, that would be like something that, you know, sometimes you go to a massage or yoga or something and there's trauma in your body. Um, and I'm always terrified of those kind of diagnoses because it's like, oh, everyone knows this about me from my voice, but I don't know it, you know? Um, is, did that come up in the singing? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I had one guy who was, you know, it, it basically felt like being on a therapeutic couch, but in, yeah. in, but, up, but upright at a piano. And I had this guy telling me, you know, where did you, you know, were you discouraged from making noise as a child in your house? And I was like, I was wow. Like, I was like, no, but um, I was, you know, sort of bookish and shy and all that. But, you know, so you, you, re you really felt like we're, I spent a lot of time, you know, talking about my childhood. And then, and speaking of childhood, you, you get doing these vocal exercises after a while that are these really elemental sort of fundamental tones that really almost feel like childlike babbling uh -huh. and sometimes you're lying on the floor doing this so you, you know sort of your, your throat the muscles in your throat can relax and gravity can help you because there's nothing talk about carrying stress in your body there's nothing worse for producing good sound than, than stress which you know mm -hmm. tightens everything so so yeah I'd be lying on the floor basically babbling like an idiot and but, the, but then after an hour I would leave on this this absolute high you know wondering like wow, wow what, what just happened from just producing these? So, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't really, I'm not really into, you know, things like meditation or something. There's probably other ways to achieve this, this sensation. But for me, it really came out through, through those lessons. That's really interesting. I mean, a very different experience than learning chess then. Just a different <laughs> part of the cognitive just limbic system involved. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean chess, chess, you can yeah, keep yeah, your yeah. dignity. You can keep your dignity <laughs> and learn chess. Yeah, I mean, th th there are moments of great, you know, yeah, it's, it's mostly sort of a competitive buzz or, or a logical, or rational brain at work, but th there are moments of these, of this sort of beauty, you know, if someone explains a game to you, you watch one of these grandmaster yeah. games and someone explains it to you, you see this, you know, almost artistic um, be beauty going on there that once yeah. you have a certain level of appreciation, I think. But. 
Um, so what did, all right, with singing, I'm, I'm going to ask you, I mean, I don't know now how many you, of these Q and A's you've done actually, but I really think that our listeners and I want to hear you sing. Um, no, no, it's, America is not ready or, or politics of despair and prose is not ready. The audience, <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Are you um, really? Really? No, I, I just, you know, it, it's like, I have to put myself into a whole thing, yeah. you know, like a whole. And also, okay. you, yeah, go ahead. Well, I, I, I do, number one, yeah, I'm shy. But number two, it, it is a thing where I do, I do, I do like I have a warm up, you know, because I treat it like yeah. a, like a sport. And yeah. this sounds a little bit ridiculous, but I, I mean, just to throw out some example, I, I don't mean to name drop here, but my wife was the ghostwriter on, on Cindy Lauper's autobiography. So she was spending so a lot cool. of time with her and this is someone who's been singing for decades, right? And yeah. every time she would come home from an interview, she said, oh yeah, she was doing these funny vocal warm-ups and exercises. And I, I started thinking like, she's still doing exercises? Like when, oh, when does yeah. it end? Um, so, you know, I, I just want to, would want to put people, you know, disabuse people of the notion that you, you could just sort of like walk around constantly bursting into song at any moment. And you know, but for, I mean, for me, it, yeah. it's sort of like, I have to get the engine, you know, sort of fired up. And, yeah. You know, I'm glad that you said this um, because um, it also reminds me that the point of your book is not about that you're going to end up uh, on the stage at the Met and even that you'll find a finished product that you can perform for people and show off. Um, it's the, the beginning and it's the thing that happens in your head, you know, not so yeah. everyone can be wowed at it. And, I, and that is, I appreciate um, you're rejecting my offer, even though I would have loved to hear you. Um, but, but it's a great, also, yeah. That's a great point you bring up though. Cause you know, yeah, it was, and, and I'm trying to just, you know, reclaim some of these things just as everyday practices that mm. people used to do a lot more of in, in culture and that we all did a lot more of as children, but have sort of been taken away from us and put in the, into the realms of, of rarefied art, you know, and that, that has to do with a lot of things. I think the rise of perfectionism in society, the, the rise of recorded media, you know, it, the, the, the amateur singing scene, you know, took a great blow when, when, you know, media came along and suddenly you had superstars in your living room. So yeah. wh why listen to Uncle Fred banging out on the piano, like some mediocre song when you could hear Pavarotti or, or whatever, but um, uh, yeah, yeah, some, yeah. But just trying to, 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 to de-sanctify some of these things and make them more into just everyday skills that, that mm -hmm. all of us are, are capable of with some, with a little bit of effort and um, So, okay, what's next? <laughs> um, I've got, I'm so bad at the order. I should get the order. I, I think, I think order memorized sur now. surfing, I think we're, we're headed to the beach. Yes, we're headed to the beach. Excellent. <laughs> and this one, you know, um, chess and singing, um, are in one category, but the just like nakedness and possibility for danger and my own lack of athleticism make surfing, take surfing entirely off the table. So that's one that I would be, I'm so terrified at that one. I don't know if you shared my terror, but, um, but I, that one is so different. That's the one that's, that's just, yeah, I couldn't do it. Um, it, so, it, it, yeah. yeah, it has a high barrier to entry. I mean, well, yeah. it, or the perceived, but I mean, also the, the people thing. are so cool. You know, the people are, or at least I picture them as just in a whole different class of coolness. They'd never accept me. Yeah, no, I know that, that's the thing. And so I, I purposely did my first lesson. I think it was a, a December, a day in December. It was you know thirty two degrees out. There was no one on the beach. There was maybe, no other students. Maybe. There were no other surfers. There was just me and the instructor. So. Whatever okay. crimes, whatever crimes against surfing I was going to commit that day, there were only going to be two witnesses. Um, and yeah, no, I mean, it's, uh, I guess there's a lot of things going on, you know, it depends on your, on your level of comfort with the water, but all sorts of things like that. But uh, it, 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 it was and is challenging. I, I, uh, there's a great book called Caught Inside and, and the author describes, someone told him that surfing is a lifetime path. You know, it's not something that you mm. can, cr you know, crank out like Tim Ferriss style in, in, in a month. I mean, maybe yeah. Tim Ferriss yeah. actually can, maybe, maybe, maybe he can, I'm not sure, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a struggle to struggle to this day, but uh, the, the, the amount of upside to this activity was just so huge that to me, the, the risks of, of failure and injury were, were just so far exceeded. I mean, it, 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 sometimes it didn't even matter if I even ever caught a wave, just, just the idea that I was sitting 
in the ocean in New York City, which number one was something I yeah. hadn't done in 25 years, um, yeah. with pods of dolphins swimming nearby. And, yeah. uh, you know, so just, it, it came with its own, you know, sort of set of pleasures that had nothing to do with competence. Uh, but. It, it also has possibly more than I think the other two, just simple euphoria. I mean, simple euphoria as a potential payoff. I mean, when you read descriptions, Bill Finnegan's descriptions or, or just, you know, hear surfers talk about it, um, where that's not quite there in, um, in singing, um, it, just cause there's less sub of the sublime in, <laughs> in, in singing, if you're not Jesse Norman and, um, and then in chess, it's so left brain and nerdy that it doesn't seem likely to make you feel one with the universe, you know, uh, the way surfing is. So maybe, maybe touch on your relationship with those sensations of, you know, the dolphins and, and, you know, what surfing opened up for you in the realm of pleasure or the kind of hallucinatory oneness or whatever it is. <laughs> um... Yeah, no, I mean, it's just, I, I, I love water and just having another way to experience water w w was amazing. And then just, I mean, there's something about, um, it's a fascinating thing to learn. It's a very, I mean, here's some of the reasons it's so challenging. I mean, number one, your schedule has to link up with a day that actually is a surfable day, which in mm. New York City, I mean, they sometimes joke about Lake Rockaway. So, I mean, Rockaway is often just flat. There's nothing going on. Yeah. So. And then you get out there, even on a good day, and you might only catch a wave every 15 minutes or so. So you, you go out there for an hour, you've caught four waves. As someone described it to me, imagine trying to play, play the guitar, learn, learn to play the guitar, and you can only strum once every 15 minutes. I mean, that's not a very efficient uh, way to learn. So right. that, that, that's where the huge amount of time uh, comes in. But, but, you, but you're right. I mean, the highs in surfing are higher than anything else. And I, I think I've, that's where I found the most dramatic, you know, sort of personal reinvention or, or re-energization -ener, re stories going yeah. on amongst my fellow beginners. And I, I for huh. them, surf, surfing really represented something, I think just because of the sheer challenge of it, that I had, the, you know, I had the sense if they could, if they could get through this, then they would be that much more prepared to deal with this other thing going on in their life or a way to excise that or, or to claim some new identity for themselves. And that's something I found in, in a lot of yeah. these classes is people kind of my age or so who had all this previous identity and they, and they were just looking looking for something to carve out that was their own that had nothing to do with their kids or their or their their, their role as a, a spouse or their job um mm -hmm. just kind of this this little corner that was just there uh for them and, yeah uh, that, that's kind of how I, I began to feel about some of these things as well almost i i use the metaphor of like they were like there were these five gardens I, I was trying to grow and I would oh. of course I wouldn't always tend them equally and I would sometimes forget about mm. one and it would almost die so I'd have to come rushing in with some water and like regrow that garden because I almost forgot how to surf um yeah this, this was did a great project for just feeling guilty because <laughs> there's five you, things you're neglecting all the time yeah <laughs> right and that you're never gonna probably never get actually make them thrive anyway right <laughs> but just keeping them alive you're right it's like a garden where like it's perpetually about to die and it's never gonna flower um but um but so um what did did you have a moment like that with surfing in particular where it felt like there were other personal challenges that you might meet in a new way or that you, I don't know, felt youth returning or a better connection to your body on some, in some profound way? Yeah, I mean, well, def definitely a sense of, of youth. I mean, you're, it, cause just you're, you're surrounded by, by that at, at the beach. And, and I think just, yeah, just, uh, you know, as someone like, like many of us who is, who's at the computer looking at words all day, you know, two feet away from my eyes, just, just sort of getting out into nature, which, which again, you sort of think New York city, I live in an urban environment. I've, I've written off nature, but you know, there, there it is. It's, it's there for you. So just yeah. being able to have that, that long stare across the Atlantic and, you know, helping my, perhaps helping my vision, which like everyone else's has gotten worse over the, the pandemic. Right. Um, but yeah, you know, so just, yeah, just, just freeing, basically just freeing the mind in, in a way that was felt incredibly healthy and, and free, you know, you had to, you have to buy a, a surfboard, but you know, otherwise you just go into the ocean. You, mm -hmm. you know, that's, um, so yeah. That's amazing. Um, all right, let's, let's, uh, well, actually we're almost to questions. 
So maybe just to um, put, maybe you can do the, what, what are we on, last two, um, just a line or two about each one of them. And then in questions, um, if the viewers, listeners um, want to ask about those last two, that would be great because then we can talk about them a little more. Okay. okay. Um, just quickly, yeah. I mean, j juggling is something that you know I really I really took up because I I, I had read so much interesting research about juggling in, in sort of psychology, and it, it's just a great way to think about how you acquire a skill because it's a very easy thing to to track, and it's very portable, and it's just very clear. And but the the, the thing I really enjoyed about juggling is just, it's just such an amazing you know sort of like party trick for lack of a better word. I mean, you, you yeah. Know, it, and it kind of reflects that. It shows that that learning curve. You, know, you don't have to go very far up the learning curve to, to sort of like be different from where, where you, not only you were, but where most other people are. I mean, if you go into sort yeah. of a room, if you go into a room of 50 people, how many can juggle three balls? Maybe some people, then how many can juggle four? Like it, it drops off and then five, it's like, forget about it. So um, just, just the metaphor is, you know, just a little bit of effort, you know, sort of just starts to push you up that, that learning curve in, in this rewarding way. And suddenly you're, you're doing these things, however, trivial they may seem, but that you could not do the week before. So that was sort of the takeaway from juggling and then, and then drawing. Where the, yeah, where I mean, the ramp for, yeah. it sounds like for surfing or even for chess, just so freaking slow and you can backslide where you probably will never forget how to juggle. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. And it's just, and it's, it's something you can do all the time. You know, you don't, you, it's right at your hands. You don't have to go it's so and, and so much, so much delight. Nobody else. So like, it's not <laughs> something people begrudge you. You know, like if you happen to know how to juggle, people pretty much always feel good about that. Yeah, and also uh, speaking of begrudging, no one's going to yell at you for, you know, juggling. Uh, surfing, there, there is that unfortunate aspect of, you know, it, it's a very popular activity. There aren't that many breaks. People are, it's a crowded mm -hmm. resource. If you happen to get in the way of someone who's better than you are, maybe they'll be polite to you. Maybe they'll come over and, and scream in your face. I've had both those things happen to me, so. Um, yeah. I've seen near, but, and, near. and also you're not being a dick if you if you're like unlike if you're if you lead with that you're a grand chess grandmaster if you're like a great juggler no one's like what a douchebag you know like where it you doesn't have a like, grandmaster category i don't think yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly well that i i think that one's so cool and then the last one um, drawing, yeah, that was just, again, you know, something that I, I wanted to, you know, it had always just been on the, the edge of my consciousness. I'd done it as a kid, I think like we all had. I tried to scribble here and there through life and didn't, didn't I had the sense I didn't know how, to, I, I didn't know what I was doing, and I, I, but I couldn't teach myself how to get past that, that barrier. And I think the real, the real problem was, it was you know, brought to me by several teachers is that, and this is a classic thing in the world of drawing, is that we're we're trying to draw the world as we think it is based on these categories we, we know about like people's eyes, people's mouths, and rather than really honing in on what, what we're looking at, if, if, we, if you really try to disengage from that categorical picture and get into the, the nitty gritty, that's, uh, you know, you're, you're going to be able to render reality in this, this sort of amazing way, but it, it requires almost like breaking down this, this consciousness of all you've all you've learned, kind of an unlearning process. And so that, that drawing class I was mentioning before, after a week, uh, you know, the progress was, was amazing. And that, you know, so it was a five day seminar, you know, nine to three. I mean, I'm not going to say we were, we were like amazing artists, but there had been a pretty incredible transformation from wow. those first, from those first self portraits to the end. And it's not like people had, you know, become amazingly fluent with their pencil, with their, their hand. It was just that being taught how to see in a different way enable them to render reality. So that, that the point again, is just, it, it's a motor skill. It's something that anyone can learn. You know, you, you can teach yourself if you, you sort of like use the right resources, but I found it very useful to have someone there, you know, correcting me and things like that. Yeah, um, wonderful. All right, the questions are really interesting. Some of them are about uh, general learning um, and some of them about the specific skills you worked on. Um, I'm going to start with Anne Shotwell's early question, which was more threatening, your physical vulnerability or the psychological vulnerability of trying these new things? I think the, I think the, the emotional, the, the, the psychic, because it, it's there much more, it's much more ubiquitous. It's sort of like, it's, it's there you know, the day before the lesson, it's there as you're going to the lesson or when I had a choir performance, you know, you have, you have know, stage fright. Uh, the physical thing in surfing, you know, I had, I did have one episode where I got driven into the 
ocean floor by a bad wave and had some had some vertebral damage. But that that was one discrete moment that you know I sort of learned the hard way, and I tried to correct. And that, that did require a certain you know you know kind of climbing back up that that hill. And I, I just tried to approach it rationally and think, how can I not put myself in that position again where that thing happened? And that is just an unfortunate part of this whole learning thing, of course, is that failure. We learn, we learn through failure and mm -hmm. kids who learn, you know, infants learning to walk are built to fail. They fall like 70 times an hour and they don't, they don't generally get that hurt. Uh, but adults, yeah, we have more fragile bodies. So uh, that's a great question. But yeah, I think, I think the emotional component is, is sort of a larger um, thing for sure. Um, all right, uh, anonymous uh, attendee um, has a question that got some upvote. So I'm going to, I think, I'm not so good with this software. Um, and so I'm gonna ask that one. What about just changing your frame of mind? Um, this person says when trying something new, instead of striving for mastery or excellence, perhaps we should just think of these activities as merely something to do. Um, is it possible or is it too ingrained in us to think that the whole point of any activity is mastery? No, it's a great point. That's exactly what, what I was trying to do. And I mean, it's, it's not that it's not always, you know, kind of hovering distant on the horizon that I think it's a natural human impulse to want to get better, sort of. I mean, and I, I sort of struggled with this. I mean, when I was looking for a choir to join, for example, I didn't want to join a choir that was, ama you know, amazingly good, but I didn't necessarily want all amateurs that were possibly, you know, worse than me, because, you know, I, I, I wanted to learn from people, but, I, but I, tried, I, I did have a sense of, you know, my own pride and where I sort of wanted to be. And, you know, I guess I, I was sort of aspiring to something there. Um, so, you know, but yeah, I, I went into these things with, with no real goals though, no, no chess rating I'm trying to hit. I just, I always fluctuate. Um, there, there's, yeah, there's, there's no goal. And, and to my mind that, but by not focusing on that, that has actually brought, brought the pleasure and brought the happiness and by not thinking that they need to be for something, um, which, you know, uh, so. That's great. Um, so uh, Glenda De Hoyos, um, in order to learn something new, grow and see progress, I love this question, in that skill, there's a time investment. So when you choose something, you're saying no to many other things. Um, with so many things to learn, how do we choose? Are there a set of questions to narrow the options? Really great question. Yeah, I would just go with your gut and go with the, the what you think would bring you, you know, what just, if you, if you had to pick from like five things that were in front of you at that moment, what would your gut instinct be? Because that, you know, don't don't overthink it uh, and don't, don't second guess it necessarily because yeah, I mean, the motivation part is huge here in, in learning. Like that, this was my problem with doing chess uh, study, for example, you know, I mean, I, I, I like chess, but I didn't love studying chess. I mean, the, the more you have this inherent desire for something, in, enjoyment that, I mean, it's an obvious thing, but you're, you're going to want to practice it more, which is going to help you get better, which is a nice virtuous cycle. So I, for my own thing, I, I really tried to just stick to this, this, you know, inner feeling of, of things I just thought would be fun without really thinking what anyone might make of that. I mean, and granted, these are pretty obvious things I was taking on. They're not like strange. I think a lot of people would like, you know, like surfing. People, how to draw is, is like one of the most searched Google terms. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you type in how to, uh, mm -hmm. everyone wants to be able to draw. Um, so yeah, I, I, I just, yeah, just go, <laughs> go for Go for what's going to, you know, bring pleasure because that that's going to give you the sustenance to, to, to go the, the longest distance, I think. But I think Glenda like points out also that um, you're saying no to other things, not just things on your bucket list of things to learn, yeah. but you're saying no, like if I decide, and I did decide in the beginning of the pandemic to try to uh, draw, I just had friends send me selfies and I tried to just draw all of them and give them to them for the holidays. Um, and it was a lot of fun, but easily my partner Richard could have said to me, why don't you learn how to cook? You know, it's like, if you're just about being a beginner, why don't you learn to sew? Why don't you learn to do something for the house? He did not say that, but like, bless him, but he would be in his rights to say, you know, oh, you're all about being a beginner when it's something kind of fun and frivolous. But when it comes time to learning how to sand the floor, you're nowhere to be found. Um, so, I, I mean, I think partly that's Glenda, you know, she's like, there's a lot of pressure to learn 
you know, at least like the new iOS, the new iOS software. That and so why? How do you explain to yourself why you choose one thing over another? Yeah, I mean, it's like like anything. I guess like like re- reading a book. I always have, I'm always haunted by the book that I'm not reading, and and there were and, and I think it's okay mm. to, to it's okay to walk away from something. I mean, I, there were I, I went to a, a, a welding uh, class in New York City, mm. a great great thing called the Metal Shop Fantasy Camp. It, it was a lot of fun, but I you just it was it was very just raw and elemental, and you're holding steel and and two thousand degree fire, and it, it's just an amazing experience. But I was a terrible welder, so I just. Mm-hmm. you know that that's a case where I it brought a little bit of you know I liked it a little bit but I didn't love it and I was bad at it so I just I didn't do it anymore and and I would get these emails down the road like hey we need some welders to help out in the shop and because they actually re- re- they recruit some of their former students and they just send out a, a mass mailing but I, I thought wow I, I could you know if, if writing doesn't work out I could start welding and you know and but I, I had no no capacity for it so I, I had to walk away so um but yeah I don't know there's what we say about iOS brings up an interesting point. You know, there's, there's a lot of things we're always learning all the time, of course. And, and the Robert Twiggers, this writer has this great book called My, Micro Mastery, which I think, yeah. you know, you, you don't always have to go for that huge thing to get the big uh, payoff. You know, you can, I, I remember like a few years ago, I, I looked at YouTube to figure out how to, the proper way to cut an onion. And I was, oh, shown yeah. this, I was shown this amazing way that really changed my life it, it, in the kitchen because I could get through onions so much faster. And how many onions do you cut? So there's a lot of, a lot of these like little like learning chunks you can bite off that, that are, are nice little like appetizers, if you will, rather yeah, than yeah, yeah. plunging into some crazy, you know, 10 year drawing odyssey. I think that's great. I mean, they're right. And they, the, some of that starts if you have a child. I just remember my first how to YouTube video. Um, was umbilical care. How do you, you know? And I just thought, I don't know that I should use YouTube to figure out how to deal with the like umbilical stump, but I did and it paid off. And, you know, all of us are sometimes, as parents, for, forced into some, to learning some weird stuff we never thought we'd do. Um, all right. So there's some questions about specific, some of the, the specific things you learned how to do. Um, uh, Oh, did the body awareness, I love this from, from Jim Bracher or Bratcher, um, did the body awareness needed for surfing, so nuanced balance, not to fall off the board, maybe Jim's a surfer, did that stay with you? I'd like to say it, it has more than it has. I, I think, I tend to think I have a natural disinclination to, to have a good balance. Uh, maybe it's an aging thing, I'm not sure, but I would try to sometimes practice off the board on one of these, you know, balance boards you can get for your you know, house and um, it, it's hard. And I've even been doing um, yoga, which is another, another beginner thing I've taken up in the pandemic. Cause I, my entire life, I've never done yoga and the balance part of yoga is a real struggle for me. And I, I'm hoping that all of these things are working in concert to make me better, but um, it, it has, it has gotten better. Uh, there's, and there's all sorts of weird things that happen, which kind of point to some of the interesting brain body dynamics that go on when we're trying to learn a motor skill. Uh, in, in surfing, for example, there's this fascinating thing that with beginners in, in all motor skills, when they were learning a sport, they have a tendency to look at themselves. So in, in surfing, what, the, what you do is you want to see where your feet are when you pop up. You want to make sure you've landed in the right spot on the board. So you look down, but that very act of looking down forces you to tilt your weight a little bit subconsciously, which mm. helps the no- nose of the surfboard go under the water and you basically mm. plunge and they call it nose diving or purling. So you know, there's all these things you have to learn to, you know, ways to control your body that are, are counterintuitive. You know, the, the mm. classic cliche is, you know, look where you want to go, but mm. it's very, it's very hard for people to do that in the moment. Cause in the moment of panic, you revert to, you know, Oh my God, are my feet okay? Or where are my feet? Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I, I yeah. one friend of mine one friend of mine struggled so much with this the instructor wrote on the front of her the nose of her board look up because she was always <laughs> looking looking down so just look up like uh but yeah it, it's the, the great the great challenge of motor skills learning is getting the brain out of the way and not thinking about not thinking about what you should do or what you want to do and just letting the, the body eventually takes over and it becomes automatic but that, that's a hard a hard process 
Um, and has it, I, I mean, you are extraordinarily humble, even about, even with your floridly obvious skills. I've always known this about you. I mean, you're just like, so you guys don't buy this for a second that he's like unbalanced and all these other things because you're a terrific writer and you would say the same thing about yourself as a writer. Um, but, um, but what about the body awareness? What, what good thing about the, about body awareness has really stuck with you? Um, I mean, do you, anyway, do you feel like your postures or your courage has changed or your sense of the ocean or, yeah, or I mean, what's, what, the, what's the, what's the thing called you describe like seeing around you peripheral or pr pr proprioception or that, yeah, that's, you know, yeah. where your body is in the world. Yeah. It's something that yoga people talk about a lot too, but I mean, interestingly, this came up a lot, even in, in singing. I mean, like singing is about, you know, how, you know, positioning your body in the right way and treating it like an instrument rather than, you know, so I would, I would sort of come into class with stooped shoulders and I was all like tired or stressed or annoyed. And, and, the, you know, the, before my teacher would let me sing, she was like, you know, you, do some deep breathing exercises, get, you know, stretch, get your body into the right, you know, position. So that this is something that often the natural way we're carrying ourselves about in the world is not ideal for the thing we're about to do. And hmm. I'm, no, I, I'm glad I, I'm humbled by you saying all these great things about me, but my, my surfing is at a camp I did in Costa Rica, my, my stance was on the board was so bad that uh, my nickname was Gumby because, you know, I'm sort of, I'm sort of <laughs> tall and thin and I was kind of like hunched over in this way that you're really not supposed to be. And, you know, the, the pictures of some of my, um, you know, pro athletes have this thing, they talk about the pro face when they're being photographed that you have to like, uh, you know, oh, yeah. you, have to, you have to look like you're not trying, right? Yeah. I looked like I was trying like 200% and I, I, I had a, a look of grim, a grimace of pain on my face. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> that was your pro face. Okay. Um, Kiri, we don't have much more time, but, um, but Kiri has a good question about juggling, which we, I'm glad this is getting some more attention. Was it potentially also more enjoyable? Cause you did light up when you, when you mentioned juggling, um, because it can be collaborative. Um, she says passing, or he says passing with others unlike the other four activities, which are solo or competitive. Yeah, and to be honest, except for my teacher, I haven't even gotten into that world because, you know, of course, just as I was beginning to get a little bit good at juggling, we're kind of get, getting into the pandemic. So, you know, that's, I, I, I would like to do that with someone. It's, it's not a world, I, it's, it's a great point, but I haven't actually done that. Um, and that would be another thing that I would feel a little bit intimidated about, I might add, because I, you know, I'm not sure I know how to do it. I'm sure someone would teach me and they'd be polite about it, but, um, but it's, it's a great point. And yeah, yeah, juggling is just, you know, it's, it's, it's just, yeah. I was just, you know, in the book, I quote the, the biography of Richard Shannon, the great, you know, polymath genius at MIT who basically invented the internet. And he was always, he had all sorts of things, irons in the fire, but one of his strange little passions was juggling and he, he liked the math of it and he just liked the quirkiness of it and he was trying yeah. to figure out how, how to make a computer be mm. able to juggle which Ooh. they still haven't I'm not sure if they've actually cracked that I know obviously computers can now beat us at chess but I'm not sure if a computer can uh, a machine can juggle five balls I'm sure it can I don't know and AI like one of those machines that's kind of un beautifully unstable like a rod Rodney Brooks kind of affair. Yeah, like those a like Roomba. Boston Dynamics yeah. things that looks like it's going to break out of its case. Yes, and kill yes, you. the whole, yeah. the dog. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. Um, I think we should. I think we should uh, get our money on the, the juggling robot. Um, I think we have to wrap up now. Um, but um, but these have been great questions, and Tom, it's just wonderful to get to talk to you, and it's just a terrific book. Thank you so much, Virginia. Thank you both so much. Thanks again, Tom Vanderbilt, Virginia Hepperman, and our audience out there tuning in. Your patronage and dedication enable us to bring you these amazing live conversations. And we wouldn't be able to do it without the book sales to support them. So we hope you'll go ahead to politics-pros.com or click the link in the chat to get your copy of Beginners, The Joy and Transformative Power of Lifelong Learning. Um, and while you're there, make sure to check out our events calendar for all of the latest and greatest from politics and prose. It's going to be a great spring. Um, we look forward to seeing you there from our shelves to yours. We hope you're out there staying safe, staying strong, and staying well read. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.